despite what it might look like in the opening scene of this video, um, I did actually get snow on my property this week. So I wanted to go ahead and pull what's left in the garden. Now I showed in one of my more recent videos about protecting my crops from frost by putting a sheet over them. I didn't fully explain what I was trying to show in that video. It wasn't necessarily to say that I could protect them from the frost by putting a sheet over them, but it was to say that I could extend the growing season in my garden by covering them each night until the ground started to freeze, and which is what I've done. So let me go ahead and pull this stuff back and I'll show you what the cabbages look like now. So those cabbages that I showed that were like this big, they're actually doing quite well. Now these cabbages did freeze overnight because the temperatures dropped down to about 20 degrees last night. So now is the time that I'm gonna go ahead and harvest all these cabbages. I typically don't eat fresh cabbage. Coleslaw is not something um, that I typically make. And sauerkraut is something that I eat on a very rare occasion. So not one of the things I make um, with my cabbages. I use most of my cabbages for stews, soups, and sautés, or fried cabbage is one of my favorites. So all this cabbage is gonna get processed and put into my freezers. But because I have allowed the cabbages to grow for basically another three, maybe four weeks uh, since I got my last frost, or my first frost, I should say, um, I was able to get them to get a little bit bigger. And the frost also will help to sweeten up my cabbages. So let me go ahead and get some of these harvested and I will show you exactly what I've managed to get. Most of the cabbages are like this where they're really, really leafy. Um, but again, these outer leaves are perfect for frying. And this was the head that I said looked like a Brussels sprout the last time. And again, it's not huge, but I do have all these outer leaves. So that was the point of what I was trying to show was not that, hey, look, I can protect my garden by putting a, a sheet over it. It was that I could extend the growing season. And one other thing about that is that, and I explained this in my live stream last night, is that when I started making these videos for YouTube, I didn't really have YouTube in mind. Um, these videos that I make, while I'm glad there are many of you that enjoy these videos, these videos that I make are actually for my family. I know everybody says that, but these videos are twofold. One, for my daughter. And some of you had asked how old my daughter is. She's only 23 years of age. She does look really, really young, but she's 23 years old. She's a college graduate, but I'm not there with my daughter right now. And this is my way of still being able to parent her and to guide her and to give her some helpful tips that might help her in years to come. So a lot of what I'm talking about when I'm giving tips and tricks in the kitchen or um, in the garden really are for my daughter. I would expect most of my audience to already know the things that I'm probably discussing. The other point about this is, is that these videos are a litmus test uh, for my family so that they can keep track of how I'm actually doing out here. Um, as I explained in my video last or my live stream last night, when you pick up the phone and you talk to somebody, you know, you can't really truly gauge, and especially if you're just texting, you can't truly gauge how someone's actually doing. But here, there's no denying how life really is here at my property. And speaking of how life really is here at my property, there was a question from Thomas Jessup who said, if it is so hard to do things there in Alaska, why live there under such hard circumstances? Well, the reason is, is because Alaska is beautiful. This is an area where people dream about living uh, for many reasons, not only the beauty, but the abundance in wildlife and freedoms, especially when you live in a remote area of Alaska, you're gonna find that there's less governance, less regulations, than there are in other parts of Alaska and especially in other parts of the country or world. And like I said, it is absolutely beautiful. 
I live here because I fell in love with Alaska when I came out here with my family on a trip um, many years ago, well over a decade ago. And I couldn't imagine living anywhere else after being here. Also because of, like I said, the amount of freedoms that I have here. I'm able to do what I want on my property without some government agency telling me that I cannot. Um, Alaska is a 2A sanctuary state. That means a lot to me as well. Hunting is a way of life out here. That also means a lot to me. And just being able to be in a place where there is such beauty and solitude and serenity is another reason. I also love Alaska. Um, or I mean, I do love Alaska, but I also love winter. Uh, winters here are very long. As you can see, it is just the beginning of October here, and I will have snow on the ground until the first week of June. So about nine months out of the year, I experience snow, and I love it. I'm so ready for winter to be here. It's the time of year that I look forward to the most, I think. So with that being said, let me harvest the rest of this garden and I'll follow up this conversation on the inside. Oh, by the way, in case you couldn't tell, this is, video is a Q&A, so I'm gonna answer um, some of your questions as I do some work around the cabin. question had come up in the live stream last night about whether or not I have enough uh, food for my winter preps. By far, <laughs> by far, I am in no danger of starving. Not now, nor have I ever been. When I first arrived in Alaska, I made sure that I had enough food to carry me through for six months. Sure, firewood purchased. I made sure that I had all the provisions necessary to be snowed in for six months' time. Even though I know I can get off my property because I have someone who's available to clear my driveway for me, I know the roads are drivable in the winter time because they maintain them on the main highways. I still have enough provisions to carry me through for six months. So at no point have I ever been in jeopardy of starving. But uh, let's check out these beets. I did not get anything that was of record size. I wasn't surprised by that. I knew that that was pretty much going to be the case. And I wasn't depending upon the beets to carry me through the winter. But after harvesting the beets, then I came inside and separated them from their tops. And I saved about two Ziploc gallon size bags of which I will wash and chop up and store in the freezer for use later in soups, much like I do with my cabbages. And I had actually forgotten that I had some carrots growing in the garden. I had thinned these earlier in the summer, but they were sandwiched between the beets and where the squashes were. And I don't think they got enough sunlight because what I pulled up was rather small. These probably won't store that well because of the fact I typically store my root crops in damp sand. And I did a video on that last year. I'll link it up above if you'd like to check that out. So the beets that I purchased at the store, these definitely are gonna get stored in damp sand. And some of the larger ones that I grew will. Um, I'll just show you real quick the difference in size here. Uh, this is gonna be okay to store in damp sand. I'll just eat these before eating these ones that I purchased. But ones like this, of course, would never last, and neither would um, these smaller carrots like this. They won't do well in the damp sand either. So the carrots, I still need to cut off the tops, wash those up. In fact, I need to wash up all of this that you see in front of me. 
but I feel really good about what I got out of the garden. This is the cabbage heads that I got. This is the largest one. This is a storage cabbage. This is the largest of the Italian cabbage, which typically uh, you'd want to eat right away, but I'm gonna go ahead and freeze these anyhow. I don't feel bad about this though. A year or so ago, I'd gone to the store to get some cabbages and they were no bigger than this. So considering that's what was commercially available, I feel pretty good about this. And other than something eating the tops off of my carrots, I really didn't have any pest in the garden this year. A couple grasshoppers and some ants is all I really saw. The grasshoppers I didn't actually even see in the garden. So that's good. No, uh, what are they called? No slugs, earwigs, or even aphids on my cabbages. And I didn't put anything on them to deter anything other than growing the mustard and the radishes, which is what I've done in the past. And that's always worked well for me. So speaking of something eating the tops off of these though, uh, my guess is that it was probably a shrew because I have that chain link around the garden. I always keep the gate closed. So it wasn't a rabbit. Uh, I don't know what else it could have been. So a question had come up about how is the ermine doing at keeping the mice at bay? Well, the ermine is slacking. <laughs> no, he actually isn't. I hear the ermine scurrying around out in the woodshed and, um, you know, he's, he's about, and I know he's busy doing his thing. And I appreciate the fact that I have an ermine on the property, but I also have another creature out here that's helping to keep the mice in check also. This owl showed up here the other night on the security camera and doing his funky little dance. And it was a joy to watch. He didn't stick around very long, but I have heard him in the area. So I know that he's doing his part as well in keeping the mice at bay. But unfortunately, the things that I did, um, it looks like I have some more work ahead of me. I am going to be putting up some sturdier screening up in front of the bays of the roof before I get soffits up there, something that they can't chew through or claw their way through. That will help remedy that, but I have not seen any more on the upper level of the cabin, which is good. But I did catch a good number of them in the cabin since posting that last video about the mice. So that's not good. I have yet to figure out exactly how they're coming in. But one of the things that I did to help prevent them from coming in the door of my cabin when I open it up, considering there's wood stored right outside of there, is I installed a screen door. That screen door is going to at least shut behind me because it's on a spring. So I don't have to worry about mice running in if I'm going through that door and have to leave the main door open for any period of time. So no, the ermine hasn't gotten rid of all of them. No, I haven't prevented them from coming in and I probably never will. I know, I know, get a cat. Get a cat, I hear it all the time, but that's not gonna happen. <laughs> not anytime soon. I would never first off get a barn cat around here because there are so many predators in the area between the owl that was here and eagles, but also fox and other four-legged creatures that would like to feast on that cat, should I have one outside? So that's not gonna happen and Keen and I would feast on it if it were inside. And someone had mentioned, can I just get a really small kitten? Um, I could probably get a really small kitten and introduce it to Kenai, but I'm not going to. At this moment, I have so much on my hands. The last thing I need to do is be babysitting Kenai and a kitten and trying to break up any fights or chasing that might be going on. So uh, it's gonna wait. And that's the last about that topic. <laughs> question actually came from me. It had to do with my last video and the rather large uh, deposits, if you will, that were left around my property over the past few weeks. I had mentioned in that video that I didn't know what had left those, whether it was a bear or a moose or even Sasquatch. 
but I'm not gonna be the one to answer that question. So here's John in Alaska, and he's gonna fill us in on what exactly made those deposits. Hello everyone, and welcome to John in Alaska. And yes, I am John. John had recorded his answer to my question. However, the upload failed. So I'm just going to read his comment that he left on my most recent video. He says, hi alone, very informative video. I just want to mention that is not bear scat or Bigfoot poop. It's moose poop. This time of the year, moose don't excrement pellets. It's from eating an array of leaves, aquatic plants, and young twigs. This makes their droppings wetter and becomes clumps. Eventually, it will turn into the pellets you normally see. Bear scat are small, solid clumps on top of each other. So John in Alaska is a lifelong Alaskan who's always lived in remote locations off of the road system. And he recently just bought a property up on Hatcher's Pass that he is fixing up and plans on uh, moving there, I believe, at some point in the near future. Uh, John is a Vietnam vet and he tells it like it is. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. He's down to earth and keeps everything very real. I appreciate John taking some time out of his day to answer this question for me. I thought at first that maybe it was a moose, but I did some research and could not find anything to validate that thought. So that's when I thought, well, maybe it's a bear, even though it didn't really look like a bear either. Could it have been bison? There are bison in Alaska, but there are none near where I'm living. At least I don't think. And Sasquatch, haven't seen one yet, so who knows. But if you're interested in learning more about John and his channel, I'll leave a link to it below. And if you're interested in Sasquatch, I'll leave a link to Nance's channel over at Buckeye Bigfoot, who relays all sorts of stories regarding Bigfoot. Hence the channel name. Well, the weather's changed. Uh, no longer is it snowing. Now freezing drizzle is coming down. And on the most recent live stream, somebody had asked if I'd gotten all my wood delivered. And the answer to that is no, I have not. What you see behind me is basically, oh, let's see, out of nine cords that I've had delivered, I have a cord stacked by the fire pit, a cord stacked by the bunkhouse. So this is about seven cords of wood that's stacked in here. And from where I'm standing to where this uh, rick is here, I can get in about another cord and a half inside of the woodshed. The remainder of the wood I'm going to actually have stacked up in front of the cabin so I have easy access to it. Now, my firewood dealer did confess to me that the wood that I received on my last delivery was actually um, last year's cut. And he said that a lot of the moisture I'm seeing might also just be surface moisture because of all the rain they received in their area. We'll see how well this stuff dries out, but I am going to be using my oil burner predominantly this year and sparingly use the wood stove so that hopefully next year I don't have to buy as much firewood and also this wood has a chance to dry out. I received a question from Joyce Waddell who asked if it's really possible to make a living on YouTube just doing two videos a week. And the answer to that is not with the number of subscribers that I have. You know, if I was a channel that had a million subscribers, then yeah, I could possibly make be making some pretty good money. Subscribers matter in the fact that the more subscribers you have, the more likely you are to have a higher number of views on your videos. The more views you get on your videos, the more commercials are likely to be watched and commercials are what pays the YouTube creators. At the number of subscribers I have, I'm not making a whole lot of money off of YouTube. However, 
I am still trying to get out as much content as I possibly can. Currently, I am doing one vlog a week, so that's the type of video that you're seeing today. And those videos are about 20 to 30 minutes in length. And as you can see, there's a lot of editing in these videos. Then on top of that, I am attempting to get out at least one short a week. And also once a month, I'm doing a live stream. For a while there, I was doing live streams um, every single week. And I was also doing a cooking video or some other alternative videos, such as Meet the YouTubers on uh, my alternate day. When it comes to doing Meet the YouTuber videos, those I do because as I mentioned, the YouTube algorithm is what promotes videos. And when a video gets promoted, it gets watched and then commercials are what pay the creator. Well, the YouTube algorithm doesn't or hasn't in the past necessarily been very generous to smaller channels. And I like to share. So I do the Meet the YouTubers so that you have the opportunity to see some other channels that you might not otherwise come across. And that's why I do the Meet the YouTubers. I've done it for people here in Alaska, people that I watch, such as the Gnomestead, Off Grid Alaska. I was watching Nomi from the very beginning of his channel, and he is about as Alaskan in spirit as they come. I mentioned John in Alaska. I would love to do a Meet the YouTuber with John if he was so willing to do one. Sorry, John, to put you on the spot like that. Or sometimes there's just somebody out there that I think is a really interesting channel, such as Bill Dixon over at the Pungo Prairie, who has nothing to do with Alaska, but is a very interesting and very talented person. And he's so talented in so many different ways that he, at one point he was even offered a TV show as, of his own. He turned it down because that's not his gig. And besides, his content is very much like a TV show in itself because of how well it is filmed and produced. Like I said, Bill Dixon is a content creator that I strive to emulate in at least my production ability, if nothing else. With some of the Meet the YouTubers, the way it's gone is I send them a list of questions. They answer those questions. They send me raw footage and I edit it. But with Bill Dixon, he did all of the work for me. I didn't have to do anything. So either way, I'm good with it. But I do plan on doing more of these. That's why I do the Meet the YouTubers. I will continue to do those. But the cooking videos mess up my algorithm. And that's because they don't draw in the same type of audience or the same number of views as do my weekly vlogs. So because of that, I'm putting a pause on the cooking videos. What I plan on doing is incorporating some cooking back into my normal weekly vlogs, though it won't be um, as detailed as my cooking videos are. It'll be more like the one where I made the Korean pancake. So if you haven't seen that video, I will leave a link to it up above. But in all of my videos that I have cooking, there's a full recipe in the description below my video. So one other way that I do make a living off of YouTube is through my channel memberships, Patreon, PayPal, Super Thanks, and Super Chat, um, as well as I'm an Amazon affiliate. So I don't make very much off of Amazon affiliations. I, I don't even think I've earned enough for them to send me any money yet, to be honest. It's so minimal. The other thing is, is that doing videos takes time to set up the videos, to film the videos, to edit the videos. And I'm the only person here. So that means I'm the only person to stack all of that wood. Now, there are things that I've had brought people in to do, such as put my roof on and clear the back of my property, but that's it. Everything else that you see being done around this property is being done by myself. And this cabin needs a lot of work. So as you can see, I'm leaning up against a countertop in my kitchen that is yet to be finished. Um, the kitchen started to get renovated last August of 2022 when my son was here and I'm still not done. 
So this is a big project that I need to do. I just think this is going to be a winter project because of the way I'm treating this countertop. It's going to take some time to do. It's not a simple uh, two day, one day process. Speaking of my kitchen, some of you have asked about if I have four freezers and I have electricity, why don't I have a refrigerator? Well, if you want to know the answer to that one, you'll have to tune in for some future videos where I will explain the refrigeration system or the lack of a refrigerator here in my cabin and also show you what my future plans are for refrigeration going forward. So be sure to tune in for that. But in the meantime, I do want to say thank you to all of you for sticking around for this part of the video. And if you've made it this far, as I've said in the past, you obviously like what you see. So if you haven't already, please subscribe and remember to hit that like button. Oh, and turn on bell notifications so you can be notified when my videos come out in the future. And also, I would like to say thank you for watching. So with that being said, which I need to quit saying, but nonetheless, thank you for being here. And I wish you all the best. Please stay safe and take care. Until next time. So that I don't have to worry about mice running in and out. Or <laughs> running in and out. Wait, that's it? You didn't want to be outside? No? You didn't you want to be outside? You just wanted to help me film? That's a good co-star. <laughs> um, I know there's a lot of people that... I'm getting sidetracked. I'm, this is not a pity party. This is just explaining the situation. The way you get paid off of YouTube is... <clears throat> pity party. Yay! It does affect my algorithm. So the algorithm is the system that, you know, it's part... I bought some new pants and it has the security tag on it. Does anybody know how to get this off? I don't have a magnet strong enough.